Hi folks, this is Mrs. Johnson. Um, we are picking up on the AP Chemistry Notes on page 6, so chapter 7 notes, page 6. What we left off talking about in class um, were the principal quantum numbers. So we have four principal quantum numbers and we use those to describe, at least as best we can, the location of an electron or electrons in an atom. So we're going to start here looking at these diagrams. These are called off-bow diagrams, and these are sort of visual representations of all those quantum numbers that we were just talking about. So let me kind of take a minute to explain this. Down here at the bottom of the y-axis, we'll just look at this one off-bow di off diagram. The bottom of the y-axis, you can pretend that this is the nucleus, okay? And as we go up, we are getting further from the nucleus and we start seeing our principal energy levels change and that's represented here by E1, E2, E3, E4. These are actually representing our N, quantum number N, the energy level. So here's N equals 1, N equals 2. What we see in um, energy level 1 is this 1S. What 1S represents is the this second quantum number, excuse me, second quantum number, which is L, right? And that's the angular momentum quantum number, and that tells us the shape of an orbital, or the orbital, the orbital type. And in this case, L equals zero when we're in ener energy level one. That's telling us we're in an S orbital. Does this sound familiar? And if you remember, we only have this line actually is representing the, the actual orbital, so that you can think of as um, m sub l. And remember, when l equals 0, m sub l equals 0. We only get one value, which means there's only one orbital. And then within this orbital, it could hold two electrons, if this were a two-electron atom. Um, and we would represent those electrons by an arrow. So an arrow pointing up would be that fourth quantum number, m sub s. That would be a plus one-half spin. Um, or you could draw the arrow pointing down, and that represents um, a negative one-half spin, either of those. So that's what these off-bow diagrams are showing. And we sort of use these as a starter when we're talking about electron configurations. They're really helpful at first. The one thing to notice is that um, as we move away from the nucleus, the energy or the spacing here uh, between these energy levels, it becomes smaller. And that's actually representing a decrease in the energy between these different energy levels. So there's a big energy difference between level 1 and 2, and the, the difference becomes less as we go on. That's just for a one-electron atom, though. For a multi-electron atom, the off-bell diagram looks a little bit different. If we see all of the orbitals have a lower energy. So in general, if this is our nucleus, everything is sort of pulled down lower in energy, closer to the nucleus. So the height on this y-axis, it does represent the energy level, but it also represents the, the energy of, of the orbitals in that sublevel. So everything here has a little bit of a lower energy. And that should say lower. This is because we have in a multi-electron atom, more than one proton, and in some cases many protons pulling inward. So that um, ha those protons pulling inward have more uh, control over these electrons, and so they shift all of their energy um, a little bit downward and more into the negative range. And remember, if you um, refer back to that equation that we looked at where it was E equals that negative constant, z squared over n squared, and I'm just going to write this part of it because it's what I really care about, z squared over n squared. As z squared goes up, our overall energy value becomes a greater negative number. So that makes sense with what we were just talking about over here. Okay. And then one more piece of terminology that I want you to know is degenerate orbitals. So degenerate orbitals are orbitals within the same principal energy level that have the same um, same level of energy. So if we look at, let's say, um, in our one electron atom, everything in energy level two has is at the same level. That means that they all have the same energy. So the, we would call these guys degenerate. So yes, for a one electron atom, the 2s, 2p, 
they are all degenerate, all have the same energy. Um, for a multi-electron atom, which is usually what we're looking at when we start talking about electron configurations, the 2s has a lower energy than the 2p's. But all 2p's are degenerate for our purposes at least, so they all have the same energy. And that gets important when we start talking about the order in which orbitals fill. And then one other thing I want to point out is that in the multi-electron atoms, it makes sense at first, let's take a look, we've got 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3d. So for some of you, hopefully this is coming back. The 4s um, orbital is actually, or the 4s subshell I should say, is lower in energy than the 3d orbitals. Um, so we see when electrons, when we're filling shells, when we're making our electron configurations, this 4s guy is going to fill earlier than the 3d. And then if we did, were to keep going on higher and higher, we would see the same sort of anomaly with the 4f orbitals. We're not going to work too much with f orbitals. Um, the reason that these fill earlier is because or the 4s fills before the 3d. This is all about the, the penetration of, of these subshells or these orbitals into the nucleus or nearer to the nucleus. So this graph over here is showing us the distance from the nucleus and the, the probability of finding an electron there. So if we look, if you can follow these lines, I know they're kind of hard to do on your, um, your notes paper because they're printed in black and white, but the 3s subshell penetrates all the way down. It has this very small region of probability really close to the nucleus. Um, and then we see 3p, sorry my lights just went off, 3p has a region um, right behind that of probability close to the nucleus and then the 3d region is out here. So we're more likely to, there's a region of, of the p, excuse me, of the s and the p subshell that's closer to the nucleus. So that's going to fill first. If we could draw the 4s subshell on here, we would see that it actually has a very small region of penetration that's even closer than the 3D, so that's why 4S fills first. Okay? And then if we're talking about representations of the orbitals, let's move down here. You do not have to memorize a ton of information about the different orbitals. I'm just going to briefly breeze through them. S and P are, are probably the most important for you to remember. Um, S actually stands for spherical. I don't remember what P, D, and F stand for. Um, the S orbitals are spherical in shape, though. If we work out the, the wave function and we get a psi squared value, we see that the probability density um, comes up with a spherical shaped map, I guess you could say. Um, so that's what this is showing here. Our nucleus in the center, S subshells have this spherical shape, and the further we get away from the nucleus, the less dense they are, the less likely we are to find um, an electron there. And this graph is also just showing that same thing, just in a different way. So as N, our principal energy level increases, those S orbitals get slightly larger. And all of our orbitals have nodes. Um, a node is just a region in space where the, there's zero probability of finding an electron. And so if we look at this graph over here, as the distance from the nucleus increases, the region that we're most likely to find an electron in a 1s orbital is here. Um, there's a zero probability right here, and that's because it's at the nucleus. Obviously, the electron can't occupy the same space as the nucleus. Um, we see more curvy graphs as we start looking at different orbitals. And so if we saw um, a graph of radi radial probability that looks something like this. That was a really bad example. If uh, here, if the the line meets the the x-axis here, that would be another node or a region of zero probability for finding an electron. And that's what this bullet point is talking about. Okay, um, the p orbitals. Remember that there are three p orbitals, and we have um, named them p x, p y, and p z. Uh, so you'll see that de designation on the off diagrams. diagrams. Um, you don't have to memorize that. We're treating them all equally for the purposes of this course. Um, what's different about them, though, is their orientation. So they lie along the X, Y, and Z axes of a, of a Cartesian system. Um, their shapes, though, are slightly different. So their P orbitals are sort of like dumbbell-shaped, um, and they're oriented around the axis, axes differently. Let's see. What else do I want to say? All p orbitals down here have a node at the nucleus. 
And what we see is that as the energy levels increase, the number of nodes that we start seeing in our, um, our orbitals also starts to increase. Um, and as far as D and F orbitals, we will use D orbitals. There are five D orbitals when we start seeing them. There's five per energy level. And then there are seven F orbitals per energy level where they're present. And last but not least for today, electron configurations. So electron configurations are actually um, telling us how the electrons in an atom are distributed among the various energy levels and subshells and orbitals. Okay, the most stable configurations or the ground state, and remember that matches the terminology we talked about earlier, is that in which electrons are at the lowest possible energy. Remember in chemistry, things like to be at the lowest energy state possible. We'll talk about that a lot in our next chapter, which is bonding. So when we start to actually write electron configurations, um, remember we use our, I use an off-bell diagram to start. That's what's down here and what we looked at previously. You won't get that, obviously, on a test or a quiz, um, but start off, for those of you who are new, by using an off-bow diagram. So when we are writing electron configurations, um, there are a few rules that we have to abide by. So electrons fill the orbitals in order of increasing energy. So we start from the bottom of the diagram, work our way up with no more than two electrons per orbital. And we kind of mentioned that today in class, and that's the off-bow principle. Um, and no two electrons can fill one orbital with the same spin. That's the Pauli exclusion principle. So when we're filling the electron, or when we're filling each orbital line, uh, we would write spin up, spin down, if we were actually drawing in the electrons. Remember, they're going to have opposite spins. For degenerate orbitals, electrons fill each orbital singly with their spins parallel before any orbital gets a second electron. That's Hun's rule. Remember, it's kind of like an orbital you can think of almost as um, its bedroom or something. Uh, the electrons are going to want their own space, and they don't want to share until they're actually forced to. So I think last year in my honor CEP class, I called them, we were talking about like a hotel analogy and beds. But remember, the Huns rule says that they're all going to take their own room or their own orbital first until they're forced to pair up. Um, and that's due to electron-electron repulsions. By placing electrons in different orbitals, electron-electron repulsions are minimized. Okay, And if we look at our periodic table, the... We can sort of use it as a guide for figuring out um, our electron configurations quickly when we get more practice. And for those of you who are new to this, it just takes practice. The periodic table, um, or the period number, tells us the value of n, or the principal energy level. So if we're looking at an element in period 1, that's row 1, it will have an n of 1. So only electrons in the first energy level. For n equals 2, or for, excuse me, an element in period two, it will have um, first energy level filled up, second energy level filled up. And its valence shell, which what we really care about, is going to be at the second energy level. For n equals three, its valence electrons are going to be in the third energy level. So for everything that I talk about here on out, we're going to do energy, or we're going to talk about valence electrons. Um, so for groups one and two, they are, this is called the S block. So here's groups one and two, S block. We call them that because their S orbitals are what gets filled um, when we're filling their valence shell. So their valence configuration ends with S orbitals. Groups 13 through 18, that's over here, we call this the P block because their P orbitals are being filled in the valence shell. So we end up with their P orbitals being filled. And then 3D, which is in the middle transition elements, this is the D block or sorry, groups 3 through 12, transition elements, they're the D block, so their valence shells usually end with the D orbitals being filled. And then lanthanides and actinides down here are rare earths. There are F blocks, so they end with F orbitals being filled. Okay, you guys, so I would like you to try that last table on page 7 where you're writing the electron configurations. We will review that in class. And if you have, like, no idea how to go about doing that, I'm hoping it's all coming back to you. But if you have no idea, I will make another short video demoing maybe the first one or two as an example how you can use that off-bow diagram to come up with the electron configurations. So watch the next video if you need help. If you feel like you got it, you are done. Work on the homework problems and fill in that last table on the notes. See ya.